much. Thank you, Rhonda. Good afternoon. Okay, I've been in your seat far too many times to know that this is hell. This is the definition of hell. <laughs> Sit and listen to somebody talk about something they think they know a lot about for two hours. Well, what we're gonna do is we are actually, I'm gonna make this more of a conversation because it is a little bit of a smaller group. I'm gonna get you to do things uh, because I want you to try and practice some of the ideas that I'm gonna be sharing with you. Um, am I not on? Test, 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 there we go. Okay, so you, okay, good. So you want me to start again? <laughs> okay, everybody, because he'll just edit this, so what I want you to do is now applaud again. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> all right, all right. And I'll, I'll, I'll just let you know that again, I've been in your seat far too many times to just do a sit and get. So because it is a little bit of a smaller group, what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna have us practicing a lot of the strategies and techniques and ideas that I've got for you. Um, they're gonna be embedded within the workshop and then sometimes I'm gonna pull them actually out of the workshop and then so you can see how I'm modeling some of these strategies but then also how then you can take it back into your classroom. Uh, the, uh, there is a handout to this, so you will need the handout because I'll want you to take notes on it. So if you don't have the handout, maybe just raise your hand and Rhonda can come by and give you a copy of the handout. Uh, so a little bit more about me. Uh, I was the director of gifted programs for the Bloomington, Minnesota Public Schools. And Bloomington is a suburb of uh, Minneapolis, uh, which we just won the Super Bowl. Uh, well, no, we got the bid to have the Super Bowl. We haven't won the Super Bowl. Vikings haven't won the Super Bowl for eons. Uh, yeah, 2018, I think it is, that that we've got the Super Bowl, so everybody's really excited uh, in, in Minneapolis. Um, and I, I, that's, that's my home base. Uh, I do travel quite a bit now because I uh, have resigned my position as director uh, and I started consulting, mainly because this book came out in 2011 and really took off with, with popularity. It's called Differenti Advancing Differentiation. And basically what it is, the book is about, is just all of the stuff that I learned as a teacher of the gifted. And I just put it into a book and made it for everybody. And, and you know, because we've been preaching and teaching this pedagogy for about 60 years. And it's been studied for about 60 years and found that all of these practices are really effective. Well, as soon as general education catches on that these are effective practices, they steal them and they take them. Well, then that makes us have to come up with new things, so which is a good thing. So uh, with that book, I ended up doing just a ton of consulting, decided that I make a lot more money as a consultant than I did in my office job. And I, was, I did love what I did in my office, in my district, uh, but I really needed a change. So I've been out consulting now for the last two years. Uh, and like Rhonda says, I do work with a lot of school districts around the United States and international Internationally. In fact, I'm off to Poland this summer uh, to work with teachers there. Um, I was just recently in Hong Kong and I was working with the Bureau of Ed there. Uh, I work with a school system in Indonesia, uh, all on this stuff about gifted. Uh, I co-authored a new book that just came out in uh, November of last year. It's called Differentiating for the Gifted. Uh, I wrote that with my good friend Diane Hecox, who also is a uh, well-known speaker on differentiated instruction as well as gifted education. We both came out of the field of gifted education and that's where we learned differentiation. Well, now differentiation was taken over by Gen Ed, so what we had to do is we had to come up with a more sophisticated level now of differentiation for the gifted. That's kind of the, 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 the hub of what we're gonna be talking about today in today's session is many of the materials that are coming out of that particular text there. Uh, you can definitely follow me on Twitter. I might even take a picture of you. Uh, so if you're in the uh, witness protection uh, 
program, you might want to just turn your back or sco scoot down when I do take the picture, all right? And by the way, I'm going to tell jokes a lot, so you better laugh, <laughs> all right? Because if you don't laugh, then I'm going to keep telling jokes, all right? Uh, one of the coolest things that I get to do while I travel is, is go out there and, 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 and experience the world of those cultures. This actually was in Saudi Arabia. Yes, I actually did kiss that camel on the lips. Uh, no, they don't spit. No, they don't bite. They're just really big Lamoxian animals that just, they have this constant smile on their face and these big eyelashes, and they're just dopey kind of animals. Uh, and so I'm out there in the middle of the desert. They're about, you know, 50 miles from the, the nearest western bathroom, uh, though everything out there is kind of like a, a sandbox, you know, like a cat box, because uh, it's just all big dirt desert. Um, now, there are about 350 head of camel in this group here, and uh, they just wander the desert for about two years before they decide that they want to go back to the barn. Uh, if you were raised on a farm or if you know cows will do that. They will just roam for a while, usually just the day, and then they go back into the barn when it's time to be milked. Camel are very much like that too. They're, they're very much um, uh, uh, homing kind of pigeon animals. They know when it's time to go back to the barn. Well, they'll roam for about two years in, in the desert. And uh, so there's not much scruff grass there, so they have to keep kind of moving Moving and they're they're very migratory and they, they will eventually go back. But uh, while they're out there, um, they can't just be wandering around because this is a herd of camels. It's not wild camels. Some guy owns these all these camels, and so while they're out there, they have to be tended and they are tended by camel herders. And camel herders uh, in Saudi Arabia are not Saudis. Saudis don't do labor. Uh, Saudis work, but they don't do labor. They don't get their fingers dirty. So uh, they hire in all of these workers to come in uh, into the country to do this work. And so this gentleman here, Mohammed, uh, is an Ethiopian. And so what they do is they hire their guest workers. They're called guest workers from Indonesia, from Pakistan, uh, from Ethiopia, from Eritrea, uh, and, and other Muslim, heavily Muslim countries. They hire them in. They come in. And they work, you know, he probably makes about mm, four or five hundred dollars a year. A year is always making. However, that's a lot more than he was making in his home country. So this is actually a good thing. Uh, so he's out there, and and he is out there, and one of his duties is to milk the camel. And camel are raised for four reasons: there, milk, meat, leather, and racing. These are not racing camel because uh, they're not on a on a racing ranch. They're just out roaming the desert. So they're meat, milk, and leather. Uh, and so one of the duties is to milk the camel. Well, they don't milk them necessarily always out in the field. They'll milk them most times when they get back to the barn. Uh, but uh, there he is milking because he was going to have us drink the camel's milk. Now, I grew up in Wisconsin. I mean, actually, younger, my younger years were in Wisconsin. My grandfather was a farmer, was a dairy farmer. And so when we were kids, you know, we'd just take the cow teat and just squirt it in our mouth and that, you know, we drank milk and, you know, we always used to get the milk from my grandpa and never pasteurize. This was before pasteurization and all that stuff. And, you know, uh, but I never tried the camel's milk because camel's milk um, has a parasite in it that our Western bodies are not used to. And so when I kept saying I was 50 miles away from a bathroom, I had to keep reminding myself that don't try the camel's milk. Don't try the camel's milk because it's kind of like Drano in our system. Uh, but it's supposed to be really good. I, I, like I said, did not try it, but it's it's supposed to be really good and good for you. So uh, we're out there, and and uh, he's uh, my friend Muhammad uh, does not speak English. So I had a translator there, an interpreter there that would translate my conversation with him, and. Uh, uh, he spoke uh, er, he, tr he spoke Amharic, which is his home language from Ethiopia, as well as uh, Arabic. Uh, he is just a basic rudimentary Arabic, but enough that he could recite the Quran because that's part of his re religion. Um, and so he was uh, he when he asked what I did, uh, I said I was a teacher, and he got all excited. He was just like really really excited that I was a teacher, and uh, he's about. 18 to 21 years old, don't know exactly his age. And he said uh, that he was really excited because he's never been to school before and he hopes to go to school someday. 
you think you got an ELL problem with kids here two years in the country, you know, you got a 21 year old who, you know, has never been to school before. So basically, you know, we would consider him illiterate, right? Okay. So we got kind of talking back and forth and I said, well, what, what is it that, that you do all day? Because, uh, you know, you're out here in the middle of the desert, there's nothing to see. There's, I mean, it's not pretty at all. And so I said, well, what is it that you do all day? And then he reaches into his pocket and he pulls out this, pulls out his cell phone. And he then proceeds to open his cell phone up and go into where he's got games, where he's got music, where he's got uh, different th uh, texts, rudimentary texts that he's sending back and forth to the other herders, because there's about seven or eight of these guys out there. Uh, and, and, and I'm like, wow, that big aha moment. Here he is, illiterate, but technically literate, because he could pull down stuff out of the sky uh, to to put up on his phone, so I'd, I you know I was like wow, the world has really changed. Here we got this illiterate individual, but he's highly technically literate. So um, that was kind of a big aha moment for me. And recently, I was I don't even remember what city I was in, and I was I was watching the morning news shows as I'm getting ready to go off to my next event because I never know what city I'm in and you know what's happening in the world. So um, I was watching a news show, and um, the, they started talking about this young lady on this news show. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna show you a video of her that I want you to watch. And if you, many of you probably don't know who this is, probably not a clue who this is. However, if you have a 13 year old, girl specifically, in your home, she will know who this is. And she will like roll her eyes at me like, oh God, okay? So I want you to watch this and if you think you know who this is, hold, hold off until I ask, but um, I want you to watch this video here. If you close your eyes, does it almost feel like nothing changed at all? And if you close your eyes, does it almost feel like you've been here before? Hey guys, what is up? What's crack a lacking? Spring is almost here. Kind of excited about that because I love spring, but I also love winter, so it's kind of a love hate type of thing. So, for my first spring themed video of the year, a part of my Hop into Spring series. <laughs> Not really funny, I know, but I thought it was a cool name, so we're gonna call it Hop into Spring. I decided to kick it off with a room video showing you guys different ways to organize all of the stuff in your room. And the cool thing about all of these DIYs is you can make them with a lot of stuff that is available at like a grocery store or Target or Walmart. And because of that, I decided to do a little giveaway for you guys to get you started on your spring organizing. A $50 gift card to Target. So if you would like to win this gift card, all you gotta do is give this video a thumbs up. Leave a comment below telling me what you are most excited for about the springtime this year. And also subscribe to my YouTube channel. What, what? Raise the roof, raise the ceiling, raise everything here, raise everything there. And I'm cool. <laughs> All right, anybody got an idea who that is? Okay, obviously you don't have a 13 year old home. Um, or you're not paying attention to your 13 year old. Uh, or, and you're not part of her 4.9 million viewers. Her name is Bethany Moda. If you're a 13 year old, you know who that is. She's got 4.9 million regular YouTube viewers. DIY, by the way, is do it yourself, if you didn't know what the DIY was. Uh, and she does all these videos, and she's been doing them now for about five years. She started at 13, and she's now 18. Uh, she's been doing it for about five years, and she does all of her own videoing, all of her own mixing, all of her own editing, all from her laptop. 
It's all done from her laptop. That really is her bedroom. That is not a set. That really is her bedroom. Uh, and she's been doing this, like I said, for about five years now. And um, you think, oh, cool. Well, here's even the cooler part. She now has major retail deals with Arrow, JCPenney, and Forever 21. Arrow specifically because they, their, their stocks were tanking and what they did is they went and f searched, scoured the internet, didn't have to look very far to find out what's the latest, greatest thing for kids who are gonna buy our materials, our clothes, and it's Arrow, they found out, they found Bethany Moda. Her clothing line is called Motivation. How cute. So these two people, Mohammed out in the middle of the desert, you know, hundreds of miles away from anything, has no academic background, illiterate, but technically literate. We've got a young lady here from 13 to 18 years old now is making tons and tons of money uh, through her own resources and has 4.9 million viewers. So the world has changed. So while I was thinking about this, I was thinking about this quote, and no fair Googling this. If we teach today as we taught yesterday, we rob our children of tomorrow. I'll say that again. If we teach today the way we taught yesterday, we rob our children of tomorrow. What I want you to do is I want you to turn and talk to a person around you, introduce yourself, to tell them where you work and just say hi. And then I want you to think about, without Googling it, because that would be cheating at this point. That would be cheating, okay? Um, later, you can Google all you want because that's investigation, but that would be cheating at this point. What I want you to do is I want you to turn and talk and I want you to think about, come up with who do you think said it, okay? That's the first thing. However, what's more important to me than who do you think said it is what is your reasoning behind why you said that? Your claim, and I'm gonna jump past evidence and I'm gonna move over to reasoning. What is your claim, who do you think said it, and what's the reason behind why you think that person said it? Okay, go, take about two minutes, go. you Googled it. <laughs> it's cheating. Oh, <laughs> well, yes it is, because I told you not to. That's cheating, see, remember? I told you not to, because it really doesn't matter, I'm gonna say this, it doesn't matter who said it. What matters more to me is the reasoning behind why you said it. Right, 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 right. Wrap up your conversations. And come on back. Who would like to be my risk takers in the room and give me their claim and then the reasoning behind their claim? Go for it. Thank you. Steve Jobs, tell me why, what was your reasoning behind why you think it was Steve Jobs that said uh, that? My reasoning behind that was because I feel like that's how he approached innovation with technology. Mm -hmm. He didn't use what was banned from the past. He created new pathways and new technology and it wasn't the one to survive it and made it happen. Okay, because of your background knowledge of Steve Jobs and just seems like 
his line of thinking. All right, thank you. Another one, another one. Yes. Uh, a young man named Devin who actually works, he's a superintendent at, in, in Vista. A superintendent in Vista named yeah, Devin. say something similar to that. Okay, and okay. I don't know if he was actually the one that made it up, but that's the, the reason why I said him okay. my claim. Okay, and your, your reasoning was that you heard him say it. Right, it was okay. Devin from um, the okay. superintendent at uh, Vista Unified. Okay, in Vista Unified. All right, Devin and Steve Jobs. One more, give me one more, yes. I don't have a name, but I was thinking that it would be someone from a very, very long, long time ago. And the idea okay. that it's, this idea is something that carries throughout time. You, you know, it's, okay. a, it's ancient or it could be as current. As current. Today. Okay, so it seems like it, it, the claim is somebody a long time ago, yeah. because because reasoning behind that is that uh, you believe that that's just kind of a perennial kind of statement that we and keep the, trying to work towards. And the idea that it would be in this interesting that. Okay. So we would all normally think current things, but maybe it was a. Okay, so you were thinking he's setting us up. <laughs> he's setting us up. That's that's fine. That's her reasoning. Okay, now. Um, who is it, Luke? Well, clearly it was John Dewey. Clearly it was John Dewey, because <laughs> he Googled it. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> looking for his evidence then, okay, yes, but that's true, and it is John Dewey, he said it in 1944, which uh, is very interesting that, you know, he said it in 1944, and it's still something that we're trying to work toward here in 2014. Um, so many of the practices that we do in our classrooms have very strong roots, However, some of the pedagogical strategies that we're using are not necessarily as valid any longer because the world has changed so dramatically. What I really want teachers to be considered, considerate of is, yes, I do want a surgeon to know exactly what the right answer is. However, when I'm gonna be teaching kids, what is more important to me as the teacher is their lines of reasoning. What are, how did you get to that answer? And if you say, I Googled it, then you know what? I've asked the wrong questions. What I wanna do is I want kids to do those lines of thinking. Like I said, it's very easy for you to Google that answer. But what's much more important to me is your line of reasoning, the thought process that you go through. Now with gifted kids, here's what I've realized. Gifted kids are so quick in that thinking process. And I wouldn't say that it's necessarily an effective thinking process. They're making, in many cases, what is called an intuitive cognitive leap, or a cognitive, cognitive intuitive leap, meaning they're just jumping to an answer because most of the questions we're asking may not necessarily require a lot of deep thinking. And we are setting them up, in a way, for failure because when things get tough and thinking gets difficult, they give up quickly because they have always gotten the right answer quickly and first. And what happens is when they have to struggle with something, when they have to work at something, they get very perplexed over it. Some of that comes from what is called a fixed mindset. Um, have any of you read Carol Dweck's book on mindset? Okay, Carol Dweck, D-W-E-C-K, uh, wrote a book. Uh, she's up here at Stanford, and she has studied um, self theory, basically how we think about ourselves for you know like over 25 years now. 
And she came up with this idea, this common idea of that we have two different kinds of mindsets, the way that we perceive the world, all right? We perceive the world as either a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. And kids and people that are in a fixed mindset basically uh, look at things and say, look, you've told me this. You've told me that I'm gifted. You gave me a test that said I'm gifted. You put me in a class that said I'm gifted. You gave me a little beanie that had a great big G on it that said I'm gifted. You did all of these things that said I was gifted. And then you put me in situations where I could quickly go through the materials and I could regurgitate fact after fact after fact and I didn't have to work at things and it was easy to be gifted. Okay, that's a fixed mindset. However, what happens with fixed mindset kids is when they meet a challenge where they don't get the answer quickly, where they have to struggle they're always now in jeopardy of having their giftedness um, undermined or having their giftedness be disproven. And that's that fixed mindset. And when kids are in a fixed mindset, they have a very difficult time working at things because they've never had to put effort forward. Now all of a sudden they've got to put effort forward. And that brings us back to this little guy here in the bassinet in the viewing window. His phone's going off and saying, oh, sorry guys, that's me. Well, our kids are born with technology in their hands pretty much. And that is leading a lot of kids to to the idea that I can answer that on my phone. I can put it into a Google search, done, okay? And that's not, that's not good thinking. So this is where I'm gonna be challenging you because I wanna move our, especially our gifted kids, into a much greater mindset that is called a growth mindset. And a growth mindset basically means, you know what, I've got certain capabilities, I've got certain things that I'm good at, but there are a lot of things that I have limitations with and things that I'm not so good at. And when I'm uh, meeting those things that I have limitations or those things that I'm not good at, I have to work at it. And it is about effort. You've probably heard about the 10,000 hour rule. Those are, those are growth mindset people. They work at it. The most successful people in the world have growth mindsets. They know, I gotta work at these things. And obviously you're well, you're pretty growth mindset here because here you are on a beautiful, what's today, Wednesday afternoon, and you're gonna sit for two hours and listen to this guy. And that's a pretty good mindset, okay? You're, you're here and you're gonna try and learn something, all right? So that's what, where I'm gonna go with this. I wanna really uh, shift the way our, we get our kids to think, all right? Uh, we're gonna do an, uh, an activity here, so if you would, if you've got just a, a blank sheet of paper or even, I don't know if there's not a blank sheet on this, uh, or you know, just get a sheet of paper, it doesn't have to be large, and just uh, create three columns. Okay, everybody, which way does a column go? Give me the hand signal, which way a column, thank you, okay? Can't tell you how many teachers will go like, Bleh. no, it's this, it's up and down. A column goes up and down, it's rows, goes across. Uh, create, th create three columns, so basically fold your paper like a burrito, because um, I'm in, in the south, so I, can, I have to say it's, this is a burrito fold, not a hot dog fold. Um, and then what you're gonna do is at, on the top of the le far left column, you're gonna put the word what, W-H-A-T. In the middle column, you're gonna write the word so what. And on the far right column, you're gonna write the words now what. This is a little thinking tool, little graphic organizer that you can use with your kids. I'm gonna, we're gonna practice how to use this. I'm gonna show you a video, another video here, and what I'm gonna want you to do, I'm, this is your what. I'm gonna want you to watch the video. I'm actually gonna play it twice, okay? So the first time you watch it, because it goes by pretty, quick, pretty quickly. I want you to watch it the first time just to get the overview. Then the second time I view, uh, show it, what I want you to do is I want you to try and collect at least three facts from this 
this information. Three what's, okay? Three facts, three what's from this information that you're gonna see here. So again, I'm gonna show it twice, uh, and, and the second time is when you should be looking for your facts. First time, just, just view it and listen to the pretty music. Oh. Now I'm gonna replay that, and now what I want you to do is I want you to try and collect at least three facts from the video. So there was our what, teaching in the 21st century. Now what we're gonna do is I'm gonna want you to turn and talk to just a group of people around you for about two or three minutes and just kind of share what are the facts that you collected. What are the things that kind of stuck out at you or struck you in this, in this uh, video? And then what I want you to, to talk about and even jot down some notes in that middle column then is your so what. So what does this mean to you as a teacher of 21st century kids? And 
And if you're specific to gifted, go ahead and just put that specific to gifted in there. However, most of us are dealing with a whole array of kids. So what, so what now does this mean to you as a teacher of 21st century kids? Okay, turn and talk with your partners. What did you write down? And the so what? No, it's okay. People say, no, no. <laughs> Start wrapping up your conversation. Welcome back. Um, I, I was listening in on, on most of your conversations and, and you, th that's a Smithsonian video, so you can actually, it's a YouTube, I just pulled it off of YouTube. Uh, you can just go into 21st century Learn or teaching for the 21st century or teaching 21st century. If you want to use it, um, you can get it on YouTube. If you can't get it on a YouTube, just email me and I'll send you the file. Um, but what, what's very interesting about that is the, there are a couple of things that jump out at me uh, specifically. The, the number of words, 450,000 words in the English language, seven times more than Shakespeare could have used. Um, and think how rich the language is of Shakespeare. 
and now we have 450,000 words. However, we're turning a lot of words, uh, we're creating a lot of words, uh, like Googling, now it's a verb. We took a noun and turned it into a verb. Uh, you know, it's fine. Uh, language morphs and changes all the time. Uh, but now with technology, the advances of technology, we have a whole new language coming out. Um, and the one that really sticks out at me, well, two things that really stick out at me. The one about uh, that we really, uh, it's not about teaching the technology. It's not about teaching the technology. And, I, and when I go to schools and the tech directors or you know, the school is all jumping up and down because they all got, they all got smart boards. Or you know, those, is that what they're called, smart boards? They all got smart boards. And I say to them, well, you know, have you read the research on smart boards? And they kind of look at me like, what? Well, really, have you, have, what led you to buy smart boards? If you've read the research on smart boards, you probably wouldn't have purchased them. Because the research on smart boards says there's no effect on student achievement, zero, absolutely zero. In fact, many teachers will tell you their smart boards cost them a lot of time because when it goes down or they make a mistake, they're having to correct it and it's taking time, okay? However, at the end of that research, then it does say that those teachers who had effect on student achievement had more than 60 hours of professional development with the, with the smart board. Okay, um, think how fast that technology is changing. In fact, when a kid comes to school, most kids dumb themselves down technologically when they enter school because the technology can't keep up in schools could be because we're publicly funded, cannot keep up with the speed of technology, even here in, you know, Silicon area, you know. Um, so that, that, that was very interesting. An iPad, uh, you know, is only about six, seven years old. By the time the, our kids graduate, a fifth grader graduates from high school, iPads probably won't even exist anymore. We'll look at those like those big phones that we used to carry around, right? So they'll be all gone, okay? The technology's changing so quickly. Um, actually, uh, when I was in Hong Kong, uh, they, they, there's, a, there's a new computer coming out um, created in, in Korea um, that is a pen, and it goes in the little portal on the desk, and all it is is just this little pen, and, and a light comes, a beam of light gets shine, shined, is that correct, shown, shown from it, and it turns into the keyboard on the desktop. And so it's just light, okay? And then it also projects a screen in the air, all in this pen. You can just carry it in your pocket, okay? And you know, they got Google Glasses now and all that stuff. So the technology is changing, and so it's not about teaching kids how to use the computer or how to use an iPad. Because I, uh, you know, I work uh, in uh, a suburb outside of Chicago, uh, LaGrange Highlands, and a teacher has a 10-month-old, and she says her 10-month-old knows how to get into her iPad, puts in the, the password, goes in, finds her games, finds her movies, finds her music, finds the pictures and all that stuff, and I'm going, I'm 56 and I'm still having trouble getting into my iPad, okay? Uh, and I'm, I probably have, you know, I've got an old iPad because it's about two years old now. Just think of that, I mean, if, when it's two years old, it's old, you know? Um, if you grew up in my household, if it was two years old, it was brand new, right? So that, that was very interesting to me. It's not about the technology, but it's how do we think with the technology, because remember, technology can't do, it, do our thinking for us yet until we get artif true artificial intelligence. It can't do our thinking for us. A computer is only as good as the person sitting in front of it, okay? A computer can only do what you tell it to do. It can't do it on its own yet. So we're not trying to teach kids how to use the technology, but what we should be using the technology for, and this gets, I, I overheard your conversation about the 47% uh, of teachers say they use technology for homework, where 94, 96% of kids use technology to do their homework, and I agree with you, that, you know, that's a, that's a percentage, and you could do all kinds of, of guessing about that. Uh, my guess would be exactly what you said, are kids just using it to glitz and glamorize the homework? 
um, you know, it, it, are they making PowerPoints? And PowerPoints, um, actually when I'm talking about this, people point at me and go, but you're using PowerPoint. Well, yeah, I know because I'm old and I don't have time to convert it into Prezi and all that other glitzy and glamorous stuff. So it's not about the technology, it's but it's how to have kids use the technology to solve complex problems that don't even exist yet. And the final thing that really jumps out at me is that in that list of what a teacher needs to be for the 21st century, did anybody see in their font of all knowledge? Okay, that's a joke. No, of course not. Because, you know, in the turn of the last century, it was possible for a person, an expert in the field, to know just about everything there was to know in a field. It's impossible now. There is so much information out there. Some of it not so great, but there's so much information out there that we as teachers cannot be the font of all knowledge. We can't know all that stuff. This is rule number one when working with gifted kids. Don't ever pretend to be smarter than them. Don't ever pretend that. Because you're not going to be, and you're gonna, you're gonna paint yourself into a corner, number one. And number two, it's not about being smarter. It's about being wiser. That's our job, is to be wise with our kids. And to help them find information to solve problems. So I'm not gonna get to the now what, because we're, I, I wanna think, consider the time here. What you would then do is then create, okay, now that you've seen these facts, now that you've discussed it and said, what impact does it have on me? Now, what are you gonna do different? What are you gonna change? How are you going to extend that out into the future? So I'm gonna give you the now what. Here's, here's the now what. What we need to do is we need to consider our classrooms and move away from the memorization of lots of information. Do not get me wrong about memorization. My first degree is in theater. Surprise! Um, I knew that was a shocker to all of you. Uh, but I did a lot of memorizing. Memorization is actually a mental activity. That's actually a good thing to do, to memorize. Uh, but when we flood kids' brains with a bunch of stuff to be memorized, it's usually regurgitated and gone. Okay, we have all had that college class where you crammed the night before the test, right? You went in and you threw it all up on the paper and you walked out of there and then if somebody says, well, what did you learn in that class? I don't know, I just wrote it all down so it's all done for me, okay? It's gone, okay? That's memorized fact. Fact can be lost, all right? It's not about the memorization of fact because in most cases, kids can pull that up faster than they can pull it up, they can pull it up on their phone faster than they can pull it up from memory, all right? They can pull it up from Google or they can pull it up on the phone. So it's not necessarily about the weight that we put on the memorization of facts. However, there are certain facts that are worth memorizing. Two times two is four, four times four is 16 and so forth. Where do I live? What's my phone number? All that stuff, declarative knowledge. Okay, that's all, that's all good, that's all good, right? What is more important to me in the classroom um, and for our 21st century kids. Well, and I'll tell you why it's important for me. I don't have children of my own. I think they'd be woo, wacko if I did, but um, I still need someone to pay my social security when I get to be retirement age. And so I want my kids, the kids that we have now to be productive in the 21st century, which means, number one, we've got to figure out how are we going to connect this content that we are told to teach, this content, how are we going to connect that to kids? There is not a child alive that really gives two rats behinds about the Revolutionary War, seriously. There's, there are many kids in this world that don't even know what the Revolutionary War is, the American Revolution, and they could care less. It's not about that. It's how do we connect the content to the student and the student to the content, okay? Revolutionary War is usually taught in fifth grade, then again in seventh grade, then again in 10th grade. I mean, we should have kids that should be Revolutionary War experts because we teach it so many times. However, if I go to a seventh grader and I say, well, I'm gonna teach you about this concept of revolution, and I'm gonna look at my seventh grader and say, when was the last time you were revolting? 
And I'll tell you when, this morning, you were revolting this morning when your mom said, put a coat on, it's cold outside. I don't wanna put a coat on, okay? The big guy telling the little guy what to do. Then you're revolting, okay? So that's how we connect. We're gonna do some, I'm gonna talk about how do we do that connection with our kids. So how do we make connections for our kids? How do we get them to think? Thinking, the level of thinking that we're doing now in the 21st century is called an evolved process of thinking. We all do, we were all born as human animals to do the level of thinking of survival. Food, shelter, air, and water, okay? We were all born at that level of slowly evolved primitive types of problem solving for survival. That's what it was called, problem solving for survival at a very low level. What we're doing now in the classrooms and in a daily life is an evolved process of thinking that happens up here in the prefrontal cortex. It is not necessarily natural to us to do that. So what we have to do is we have to actually teach specific strategies to kids about how to think. You just used one, what, so what, now what? And I'm gonna do a couple of more as we go along. It's the actual strategies that we have to teach kids and get them to practice these strategies of problem solving and get them to practice them over and over and over again until it just becomes natural for them. I, now that I've been teaching what, so what, now what, I use it all the time. I use it all the time. I use it when I get on a plane. Okay, what, I'm sitting on the plane, so what? Well, so what, you know, do people even know I hear? You know, what happens if the plane goes down? Does everybody, you know, does anybody even care about me? Now what am I gonna do? I'm gonna quick text everybody and say, I'm on a plane right now to San Diego, okay? Problem solving, so we're gonna teach kids how to do that problem solving, that thinking process. And then we're gonna get them to solve problems. However, we gotta make sure that the problems that we're solving are worth solving. Now, the idea of that, you know, 94% of kids use technology to solve, to do their homework, where 74% or 47% of teachers say they do. But this is, a lot of times what they're doing is they're solving problems that aren't worth solving. Okay, the problems that are gonna exist for their future don't even ha haven't even happened yet. I was in a seventh grade algebra class in uh, Brooklyn, New York, and they were prepping for a regents test. Uh, the regents test is like their state test. And the teacher was teaching the kids the process of the questions that were gonna happen on the test. And she gave, threw out the example, and she says, okay, boys and girls, we're gonna practice some of the examples for the test. A train leaves Boston going 45 miles an hour and is headed towards Penn Station. Another train leaves Penn Philadelphia going 65 miles an hour and is headed towards Penn Station. Now you know where I'm going with this, okay? Which train will reach Penn Station first? Okay, this little guy sitting next to me, because I'm just doing observation on the environment and stuff. Little guy sitting next to me turned as quick as a dime and said, don't she know she can look at the schedule? Exactly, because that's not a problem we're solving. Now, to get to the equation of distance, what is it, rate equals distance times time, that, that, that equation is valuable. However, the context that it was put in is not worth solving because that's not a problem that kids need to worry about, trains getting to Penn Station first. Okay, those aren't problems that are worth, uh, worth solving. So I'm gonna want, I'm gonna really put this to you is how do we get problems going in our classroom that are worth solving for our kids? All right, so that's kind of my mantra for the 21st century of what we should be doing in our classrooms with our kids. So that, that strategy you use, what, so what, now what, is you've heard of a KWL, right? What do, you, what do you know, what do you want to know, and what did you learn kind of stuff. That's a very passive, self-directed uh, type of, of graphic organizer. Nothing wrong with it. However, it's very simple. For gifted kids, what I want to do is I want to crank it up a notch. I want to step it up for them. So what we're going to be doing is what is called translation, interpretation, and extrapolation. Translation means that you basically just regurgitate. Okay, I'm just taking it and putting, writing it down. That's translation. Interpretation then is I have to look at that information and interpret it and say, so what importance does that information have to me, to someone else? So what? 
extrapolation to means to move beyond the self and put it out into the future is what extrapolation is. So when we use extrapolation, what we're trying to do is we're predicting, we're inferring, we're referring, we're sending it forward into the future. There are ways that you can use this technique. You can use it as a note-taking device. You just did, you just did exactly that. You used it as a note-taking device. So we're gonna watch this quick little video. We're gonna come back and we're gonna discuss it and then we're gonna extrapolate it. Um, now, the other thing I want you to do is I want you to start using big words with your kids too. Use big words with them because they've got to start understanding academic language. We've got a lot of kids that couldn't tell you what analysis means and we tell them that all the time. So I want you to use the language. Summarization and synthesizing. So summarizing you in the what would be facts that you write down from the text, put it all together in the so what and then extrapolating it is now synthesizing it into the future. Um, helps with creating an original line of thought. In the now what, um, that's your thoughts. You cannot Google that. You could Google the what, but you really can't Google the so what or specifically in the now what. So it helps kids come up with their original lines of uh, thinking. Um, a teacher shared this one with me is that she uses it for developing literary devices. So uh, let's say we're gonna do tone, mood, and main idea, or sub-themes. Let's do sub-themes. Tone, mood, and sub-themes. So those are the three things that as the kids go down there, there are three boxes on her, in her columns, okay? In the what, what you're gonna do as you're reading along, what you need to do is you write down text, direct citations from the text of examples of text that show tone, that show mood, and show or highlight the sub-themes sub within the text. In the so what, how do those all link together? So why or so what that this author use these particular techniques, what made it valuable, what made it useful, and so forth. In the now what, what she has the, the kids do then is create their own examples of sentences that would show tone, sentences that would show mood, or sentences that would show sub-themes. So it's a way to help kids uh, come to grips with the, with the, 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 the uh, literary devices. You can also think of this, the what is the claim the so what is the evidence, the evidence that you've collected, and the now what could be your reasoning. So you could use it in that respect too. What we did is we had a claim that it was Steve Jobs. We didn't have evidence, I didn't have you collect evidence, but you jumped right into extrapolation. Why do you think that that was said? So um, that I keep saying claim, evidence, reasoning, C-E-R, claim, evidence, reasoning. The fourth uh, piece of that, that term, claim, evidence, reasoning, is now counter-argument. You're gonna be doing that with gifted kids is the counter-argument component, so it's called CERCA, C-E-R-C-A, claim, evidence, reasoning, and counter-argument. That's not up here on, on these three forms here. We'll talk about that in, in, a, in a moment there. Um, oh, and by the way, if you need to take a little break, a little restroom break, you go do your thing. You don't worry about it, because we're not gonna take a break because it was only two hours. So just you know, feel free to move when you need to move. All right, um, it, it's also helpful for research reports. Now, um, I, I was in a district recently, uh, which I have a sustained contract with that district, and I'm going around to all of their elementary buildings and, and doing observations in their buildings and coaching teachers and you know all that stuff and every single building I went into whether it was kindergarten or whether it was fifth grade somebody was doing a research report on penguins <laughs> on penguins and I kept saying what is it with this district are they, are they training a bunch of penguinologists here I don't I don't get it why why are we learning about penguins well they're basically um, Elementary people, and, and I was an elementary teacher and a middle school teacher, but, but elementary, we've got a misperception about what a research study really should be. Because a research study really should have that third leg to it of now what are you gonna do about it, okay? So let me show you, and, and also it's a really helpful tool and in, in, in this tool can be used for countering plagiarism because that third leg, the extrapolation, you can't Google that. Um, and now, you know, kids today just really do not think that they're plagiarizing. 
right, when they go and cut and paste from the websites, right, they don't think they're plagiarizing. However, though, when we plagiarize, now, come on, everybody's plagiarized someplace or way. When we were in fourth grade, you know, we had to go and pull out the Encyclopedia Britannica, pop it open to page 862, find that quote, and then hand carry it over to the page, you know, and that took us time, right, to plagiarize. We knew we were plagiarizing because it took us time to do it. Well, kids today don't even know they're plagiarizing cut and paste, you know, because I've got this, you know, that that's cut and pasted from a website, okay? That's not plagiarizing. Well, yeah, it is. Okay. Well, of course, that's that came out of my computer, so I do own it, but Here's, here's a way that you can use the what, so, what, now, what, and this was actually done by a fifth grade teacher that I was working with in said district. Uh, instead of saying, okay, just we're gonna do this research report on penguins, what I want you to do is uh, what, what would be the natural impact, what would, be the, what would be the impact of a natural disaster on the local community? That's your question. So kids had to form questions first. That's the what. Then they had to form another question. So what should community members do to prepare for such a disaster? So what? And then, then the now what? Now what can you do to protect your community? The third leg is extrapolation. We wanna move it out away from the self, okay? So that's how uh, you can use it, as, especially in an elementary level, use it as a research reporting device. Um, in math, uh, especially for kids that are struggling with math, what's the problem or what's the answer? Uh, so what will you do to solve the problem? So this can break it down into three columns for kids. And now what process that you used can be used in other situations? Because remember, it's not so much about the answer, it's about the process of getting to the answer that I'm most concerned about, especially with gifted kids, okay? So a couple of just little examples that you can do uh, using that what, so what, now what. Um, let's move now into the nuts and bolts <laughs> in the next 45 minutes, the nuts and bolts of differentiation for gifted kids. I've shared a couple of ideas with you. Now I'm gonna go into kind of the meat and potatoes here of, of differentiation for gifted. Um, you know, first what I wanna do is I wanna frame for you the idea of what is differentiation. Uh, because I'm getting paid to do this and I'm standing up here, you're gonna follow my direction on this, okay? Just for today. And you can walk out of here and go, that's not what I believe. Well, but for this purpose, you're gonna believe what I believe, okay? So first and foremost, differentiation really is trying to take into account that the students are at the center of instruction. Doesn't mean that they sit in the center of the room. What it means is that, that we have to know, that was a joke, people, that we have to know enough about our kids to be able to decide there are certain things that kids are good at, certain things that other kids are not good at, certain things that some kids are great at, some, certain things that other kids are not so great at. And so we have to know enough about our kids to be able to inform our practice. Now, in the secondary level, if you're a secondary teacher in middle schools or high school, you've got 150 kids. That's gonna be kind of impossible to try and figure out every single kid, right? Well, what you're gonna do is you're gonna kind of generalize. You're gonna have to take into account some generalizations. Elementary, we got a little bit better task for us because you know we got those kids most of the day and we get to know them uh, at a much deeper level. Um, so when you think about secondary kids, you're thinking more in a general sense, okay? First, Thing. Now there, there, are, there are things that can be differentiated and then there are ways to differentiate. What we're gonna do is we're gonna start off with, first of all, what can be differentiated. The what that can be differentiated, the first one is the environment. The environment, yeah, the where and the when of learning. The, think about your classroom environment. How conducive is it to learning? This room right now is probably the least conducive place for learning. One, because the chairs are uncomfortable. Two, because there's no natural lighting in here. It's just kind of sterile. Plus, we're all in rows and columns, which if you have rows and columns in your classroom, don't invite me into your room. Because I will, that, I will, I will sh shriek like a, like a banshee in your room. Because rows and columns are ineffective instructional practice. What we should be doing is getting kids in clusters. We should have kids facing each other. We should have kids working in teams. They should be working collaboratively. And I even suggest abandon the desks, get rid of those desks, 
because kids don't go home and sit in a desk. They go home and lay on the floor, they lay in their bed, they lay on the couch, they might sit at a dining room table maybe, but they don't go home and try and find their desk, okay? Kids are kids, so we gotta give them space. So consider the space, and there are all kinds of different things you can consider. Boys in general, uh, based on the neurological studies, show that, they're, that boys are more uh, prone to want, are attracted to natural light, especially for reading. Um, natural light is a much more effective uh, way to read for boys because the light is is clearer for them. Uh, women's eyes are not as 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 articulated as men's are and boys. So unnatural lighting is not as difficult, but natural lighting is more specific for boys. So getting boys to sit closer to the windows, sitting closer to natural light, sit, having sounds in your room, uh, white noise. If you got a lot of ADHD or ADD kids, having white noise in the room, like a hum of a fan that actually kind of settles them down. Those kinds of things are all environmental mental, the where and the whens of learning. Um, what I want to move into are the other critical components. So then the, the next thing that can be differentiated, another what that can be differentiated is content. Now, in education, we tend to use a lot of vocabulary that uh, we misuse. And we don't know what we're talking about when we say that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I got a rigorous curriculum. What's a rigorous curriculum? What does it mean? Okay, I can ask everybody in this room what those two terms mean and I'm gonna get about 15 different answers, okay? Well, I'm gonna give you those terms and the, and the clarity of those terms because when we're unclear about those terms, our kids are unclear about what we, what's expected of them. Content basically is your curriculum and your curriculum is not your textbook. Your textbook is a source, not the source. I know I get curriculum directors upset at me all the time. C textbooks are not the source. In fact, for gifted kids, they're probably the least useful source for them. If you're teaching in a, a social studies or a science class, your textbooks are probably five years out of date by the time they hit your desk. Because usually a textbook takes about five years of uh, pre-production before it gets out. Um, they're usually out of date. They're usually, uh, there's a lot of politics with them. There's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, philosophies that go behind them. So there, that is a source, not the source, okay? Um, so, but your content, your curriculum is really divided into three things. What you want your kids to understand, what you want your kids to do, and what you want your kids to know by the time they walk out of your classroom. That's what your curriculum is. So if I walk into your classroom and say, tell me what your math curriculum is. And if you say, well, it's everyday math. Oh, no, 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 that's a text. What's your math curriculum? What do you expect students to understand? What do you expect them to be able to do? And what do you expect them to know by the time they walk out of your classroom? And that's gotta be very clear and very succinct. And I'm gonna give you a couple of examples here. Um, the process, the learning process is the next thing that can be differentiated. So I can differentiate the learning activities that students do to acquire the content. So I can have them in different learning experiences, learning activities that get them to own the knowing, the understanding, and the doing. So that's learning activities is the process. Then finally is the product. And the product is how students show what they've learned, not what they know. Don't say that. What do kids know? Well, because what kids know is what they can regurgitate, not what they've learned, especially for gifted kids, because gifted kids walk into your classroom and know a heck of a lot. In fact, studies that were done by uh, Karen Westberg and Sally Reese at the University of Connecticut many years ago, but it's, uh, they keep replicating and finding basically the same thing, that amongst the gifted kids, they knew 80% of the content before they even started the school year. So what the study was titled is, Should Gifted Kids Start in January? Was the name of the study, yeah. Um, so what, what we have to be concerned about is they knew a lot of stuff. Could they do a lot of things? We don't know. Did they understand a lot of things? We don't know. 
but it's the knowing that they have, they hold on to a lot of that knowing stuff. Two times two is four, four times four is 16, and the uh, War of 1812 was in 1812. They've got all that stuff, okay? So what we wanna do is we can differentiate the product, how they show what they've learned. That's the what that can be differentiated. Environment, content, process, product. How it can be differentiated is in three ways. I can differentiate based on interest. Number one, I can base it on what kids are interested in. So you might be interested in ballet, you might be interested in baseball, you might be interested in, in rock music, and then I can try and adjust my content to address your interests or adjust the learning activities to allow you to work within your interest levels or, allow, or adjust the product so that you can create a product then that uses rock music or baseball or, or ballet, okay? Um, now that's one way. Another way you can use interest is how do I get you interested in what it is I'm going to teach you? Now, Madeline Hunter, any of you remember Madeline Hunter? Okay, a couple of us oldies remember Madeline Hunter. Madeline Hunter uh, was actually a, a student of Benjamin Bloom's, and she came up with this idea of a lesson plan, and remember what, anybody remember what the first step in a Madeline Hunter lesson plan was? The anticipatory set. And you know what anticipatory set is? To peak interest. We've known for eons, the number one factor of being able to pay attention to something for a long period of time is interest. If I'm interested in it, I will pay attention to it. If I'm interested, I'll pay attention. And so what we want to do is we can use not only the student's interest, but we can differentiate it in a way to get you interested in it. And I always say the best motivator in the classroom is the teacher. Sharing your passion about what you do and having that, that, that energy around you because your attitude is contagious. Okay, so the more energetic you can be about things, the more likely you are to get kids interested in it. Um, next would be readiness. Readiness is not about ability. Let me make that clear. Readiness is not about ability because you're not always gonna group your gifted kids at high levels of readiness because there are some times that they may not be at high levels of readiness. I say readiness is about the preparedness for that lesson that day. The preparedness for the now is what, how I like to look at readiness. Readiness is about the preparedness for now. Some kids have not had enough exposure or prior experiences or prior knowledge with the content, so what I'm gonna have to do is I'm gonna have to give them a front-loadedness because they're not as prepared. Okay, I might have kids, if I'm going to uh, do different learning activities, I'm gonna have to prepare kids uh, for those different activities. Some activities are gonna be, have to be highly structured and some can be more open-ended because kids are more or less prepared. Uh, products, uh, I do not necessarily recommend that you should uh, differentiate products based on preparedness because when they get to the product end, when they get to showing what you've learned, they all should have gotten to the same point pretty much. Okay, you might do adaptations and modifications for your, your special ed kids, but really when, it, when you talk about preparedness, they all should be prepared to show what they've learned, okay? So I don't like to differentiate the product by readiness because that, that would uh, be lowering the bar for some kids. Um, then the final one is learning profile. I actually like to use the term learning preferences because we all have different preferred ways of learning things. Some people like to learn it through auditory processing. Some people like to do it through visual processing. Some people like to do through acting or kinesthetics. Some people like to do it through verbal linguistics, okay? There are modalities which tend to be your senses. And then there are styles which we mostly use Howard Gardner as an example of styles, and that's a learner preference, the preferred way of doing, okay? So that is just a snapshot picture, non-linguistic basically, non-linguistic representation of what is differentiation. That's for all kids. 
Now, that was originally designed for gifted kids back in 1930. That was originally designed for gifted kids. It got reborn by Carol Tomlinson in the late 80s, early 90s. And guess where Carol Tomlinson first got her, PA, she got an EDD. And you know what her EDD is in? Gifted from the University of Connecticut with Joe Ranzulli was her chair, okay? So she came out of gifted land too. Um, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this now, those particular ideas, and I'm gonna show you how you differentiate it then for gifted kids and what makes it different for dif gifted kids. First, we're, the what is the content, okay? What I want kids to understand, know, and be able to do. We're going to use a more advanced level of the content, which means that what we're gonna do is we're gonna look into the interdisciplinariness of the content, even if you're in a secondary level where you may not necessarily uh, have contact with other content areas because you know, in secondary we like to put things in silos and oh, God forbid that a math teacher should talk to the science teacher, that should talk to the language arts teacher, that should talk to the family consumer science teacher, the music teacher, teacher, okay, um, they're all in silos. However, in a secondary classroom, what you have to do is you have to hope the kid or teach the kids to transcend it outward. So here's what an example would look like of an advanced content. It doesn't matter what content area, but this is how we do it for the advanced level. What we're gonna do is we're gonna try and link all of the courses, all of the learning that kids have through these ideas of what are called concepts. All right, here are three examples of concepts, power, conflict, and desire. Uh, in many cases, especially like middle school, you can use them as a thematic idea. I don't like to always call them themes because sometimes I go to schools and schools have themes like bubbles. Okay, well that's not a concept. So what you can call it is a conceptual theme. And so these are three conceptual themes. Once you decide on what the concepts are that you're gonna really burrow down into within your content, then what you do is you create really good meaty questions. These questions you cannot Google the answer to. Here are some examples. In what way has power influenced your life? That's a good universal essential question. How do systems support certain power structures? Now obviously those two essential questions were written on the concept of power. Uh, you know, when you're working through essential questions, what you're asking kids to do is take those questions from one content area to the next content area. So good essential questions cross over content areas. They don't just sit in the content. However, I can craft those into content questions, which would be just fine. You could say, let's say, how do, uh, how do uh, certain governmental systems support certain power structures. Okay, that would be a content-based essential question. Okay, but I've, I've got it up here in the universal because what I want gifted kids to do is crosswalk it to someplace else. So that's content. The next is through sophisticated process. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be asking our gifted kids to raise the bar in thinking. All kids should have access to complex thinking. All kids, all kids, all kids. However, what we're doing with gifted kids is we're using a much more sophisticated level of those complex levels of thinking. So, what we're going to do is we're going to create complex problems or actually ask kids to find complex problems that don't have easy solutions. Here's one. Uh, in a local, uh, let's look at local issues. Uh, consider a local issue that includes the struggle or complexity of power. What's the issue and what recommendations can you make to solve that problem? So they're taking these essential questions then and taking them out into the real community and having to work with them in the real world. Here's an example of a question that actually was used, oh, oh no, actually, uh, this, this is, a, 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 um, as I look at the Common Core, you've all heard of that term, Common Core, right? <laughs> Like a, like a needle through your brain, right? Um, uh, when, when I look at the Common Core, what I wanna wanna do is that, that Common Core is written for all kids, right? But what they did is they went into gifted land and took all of our great ideas. 
And now Gifted has to ratchet it up a notch, okay? So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take a Common Core standard and apply a question to one of the standards. I can't tell you exactly which number it is, but I have a friend who can tell you exactly what number that would be. Here it is, analyze the similarities and differences of lead characters in Romeo and Juliet and Midsummer Night's Dream. That's where the Common Core standard ends, right there. That's where it would finish, okay? However, for gifted kids, what we're gonna do is we're gonna add a level of sophistication to the level of complexity, because an anal analysis is a higher level of complexity than just recalling, okay? Analysis is at a higher level. But what I wanna do is I wanna take it down and get it more deep and more sophisticated. So then what I'm gonna do is define a common principle of power that links them all together. This is what is called third level of analysis. Analysis basically has three levels to it. Identifying attributes, comparing contra contrasting similarities and differences, and then third, identifying common principles that link or dislink them, okay? And so what I'm having them do here is I'm having them look for the common principle of power that link all the characters together. That's a third level of analysis. Not all kids will do that or can do that, but this is what our gifted kids should be doing. It's taking that common core standard one level deeper. Finally, unique products. What we should have our gifted kids do is what they're doing is they're creating authentic products for authentic audiences. That's why I use this picture here of a, of a theater because we in the arts have done this forever. In sports, we've done it forever. Uh, what we're doing is we're creating products that then transcend and then are going to be evaluated by an authentic audience. So what we're looking for is having kids craft products that have value beyond the classroom. Teachers are not authentic audiences. So what I wanna do is I wanna have kids creating products based on what they've learned to then create a product that has value to someone else. So here's an example. After the study, and I actually did this one, after the study of myths, legends, and folktales, create a new myth, legend, folktale that represents the benefits or responsibilities of power, okay? That's where, nor where it would probably end for most kids. However, where it gets more sophisticated and produce a book for younger students. So when I did this, I evaluated their product of the myth, legend, or folktale, you know, based on my rubric of, you know, did, did was coherent and da, 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 you know, all, you know, did it have beginning, beginning, middle, and end, and it did have a moral and all that stuff. And then the kids created their product, their, they produced the books, and then they sent them down to a lower grade, uh, into the, you know, another school or down to lower grades. And in there, there were about four or five index cards that the kids created an evaluation form on. And if they were using, doing kindergarten, they had, you know, a smiley face, a neutral face, and a sad face, okay? So they had like three or four questions for each reader of the book. And then when the kid evaluated it, they put it in the back cover. And then at the end of the course, uh, the kids were then given those cards back. I'll tell you, the kids could have cared less about my feedback on it. They were so much more interested in the, the valued audience in what the valued audience said about their products because that was valuable to them. They, were, they, they created a product that had value to someone else. Here's another example. This one was done by a ninth grade civics teacher. Uh, he used to just send his kids to the school board meeting to just watch the school board meeting. Then they came back and shared what happened at the school board meeting in the class. Well, he pushed it up a notch and what he did is they made a, a report to the school board and school district after having observed a school board meeting where they had to discuss the sharing and the representations of power. Who had power, who didn't have power. It was scary for the board members, okay? So the, valuable, the value of that product, all right? When we're going, now, those are the things that we want our kids to be producing, using advanced content, working at sophisticated levels of thinking, and then creating unique products that have value to others. Those three are critical. 
how they do these things then, we're looking at our kids working more as disciplinarians within disciplines. Okay, let me explain that. English is a subject. Journalism is a discipline within the subject of English. A journalist is a disciplinarian within the discipline of journalism within the subject of English, all right? So I want my kids to be thinking and performing as disciplinarians because a disciplinarian will use different tools. So if I'm in a copy editor or a photograph, a photographer, I'm gonna use different tools. However, we're trying to get at the same thing. So I want my kids to be working within the disciplines. And what they have to cultivate is what are called scholarly dispositions. And these are the scholarly dispositions here. Whoops. These are the scholarly dispositions here. What we want our kids to be, especially my gifted kids, because they can get a little arrogant. Have you noticed that? A little arrogant about their, their smartness. Well, um, I created a, a program in Bloomington uh, uh, Public Schools that's a school within a school for highly profoundly gifted kids. And they're all kids with IQs greater than 140. Um, and it's a school within a school, starting off at second grade, going all the way now till 10th grade. And uh, by the time they finish 10th grade, they can go then to college, 11th and 12th grade, it's called post-secondary. And by the time they finish 12th grade, those kids will have amassed enough college credits to have earned an associate's degree in engineering. Um, when they're in the program, I have an exit policy because when you get knighted for giftedness, you can lose it too because it could be on your arrogance that you lose it or it could be on your lack of performance. And these criteria are what we're using to uh, have kids maintain placement within the program. Because to me, it's much more about your ability to be a scholar rather than a student. A student is passive. A student takes in information and throws it back up. A scholar actually takes in information processes that information and then does something with that information. So I want my kids to be acting as scholars and in fact we call them scholars, we don't call them students, we call them scholars. And so they act as scholars. If they don't meet up, measure up to those standards, they are exited out of the program. And they get a warning, but then they're exited out of the program. Uh, because it is not, gifted programs should not be a place holder uh, for the elite. What it's about is you work hard at it. And we have to teach gifted kids how to work hard at things too. Um, what we're also help, hoping kids will do is working in topics of interest because a lot of times in the content we're not gonna get through all of it. So what we want kids to do is do independent studies that are based on their interests that go beyond the core. And what they're gonna be doing is they're gonna be de developing more advanced levels of self-regulation. And what do I mean by that? Self-regulation is basically the tools that we use to manage ourselves to be successful. How we perform, how we set goals, how we monitor those goals, and then how do we reflect back on those goals. That's good for all kids, but what we're talking about is a more sophisticated level of that because they're having to set more goals that are independent of the teacher, not always dependent upon the teacher. And so they're gonna be using much more advanced levels of self-regulation. That's a whole nother workshop is on self-regulation. So um, maybe if I come back next year, I'll talk about self-regulation and give you tools about how to help, especially gifted kids, manage that, that thing that's called self-regulation. Uh, um, let's do this. Let, let, I'm at a, a little, I'm gonna shift gears here. So let's just stand and stretch for like just 30 seconds, just cause I don't want you to like, get a little too comatose there. And I need to get a drink of water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, and have a seat. Okay, 20 minutes and I've got like, I haven't even gotten through page two, have I? <laughs> I got a lot more in there. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just go into this piece here and then I'm gonna just kind of give you a quick overview of what's remaining within that handout uh, because I'm not gonna be able to cover it in 20 minutes and I don't wanna hold you any longer. 
those were the ideas that I just shared with you. Advanced content, sophisticated process, unique products for gifted kids working as scholars within the, dis within the discipline. Now what we're gonna talk about is what do you do in your classroom with your gifted kids? There are three things that you keep in mind in your classroom. First is called pace. What is the pace within your classroom? Now with gifted kids, what we're talking about is an accelerated pace. However, do not take accelerated pace as being talking faster. That's not what it is. I'm gonna share with you just a couple of examples about what that, what that might look like in a GT classroom. We're gonna be working more in depth, which means that we're going to be uh, increasing the discipline knowledge and practice within the content. So we're gonna be working more at the conceptual level of knowledge within the classroom. And then complexity. What we're gonna be doing is using more sophisticated levels of questions within the classroom so that kids are having to do a deeper level of thinking. Let me give you some quick examples of accelerated pace. Accelerated pace requires that you have a very solid, concrete knowledge, succinct knowledge of what it is that you want your kids to understand, know, and be able to do by the time they get out of your class, which means that there are going to be times where you're going to eliminate content because the kids have already mastered it or move more quickly through it. Also, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be asking kids to acquire some of that knowledge outside of the class period because that stuff is fundamental to where we're going. So we're gonna be spending less time in the didactic instruction. What do I mean by didactic? This is didactic. Most of what I've done today, almost all of what I've done today is didactic. Didactic instruction tends to be a singular modality and anytime you're teaching within a singular modality, you always need to include other modalities or most of the information will be lost. Okay, that's why again, I had to just stand up. Uh, we did some turn and talks. We did some, uh, you did some video observing. So those things are less didactic. But in a GT class, I'm saying that about 10% of 10% of the voice heard in the classroom is the teacher, and about 90% of the voice heard in the classroom is student. We're talking about having, having substantive conversations in the classroom, that we start off the class with a provocative question that gets us into the content. We start off asking questions and see where the conversation goes. Yes, I as a teacher have certain things that I want them to master, certain things that I want to have completed within this time period. However, we need the kids to be driving the bus rather than the teacher driving the bus. So more advanced levels of questions and deep discussions. Um, we're gonna be using essential questions. We're going to be developing essential questions. Kids are gonna be developing those essential questions and they're gonna be constantly working on possible answers to those questions. And again, we're working more in the conceptual domain of the content. Um, in that process, of coming up with this idea of accelerated pace, my friend Diane Hecox and I sat down and really discussed what are the pedagogical components of a general ed classroom with gifted kids in it. And what we, we came up with is this design that we call the TLC, the Teaching and Learning Continuum. And this yellow triangle that you see here, this is what is called teacher control. And the red triangle here, the inverted triangle, is what is called student responsibility. In this model, as teacher control reduces, student responsibility increases. We took our work uh, from Fisher and Frey's, uh, well, th they popularized the gradual release model. We took our work from uh, Carol Dweck's work, took our work from uh, you know, basic uh, neurological studies on, on adolescents and so forth. And so what we, we, we found is that there's actually four levels that we use within the classroom. And the first level is what is called didactic. And I've already explained what didactic is. I'm gonna tell you everything. You're gonna learn it because I'm telling you what you're gonna learn. 
The second level to that is called facilitated. In a facilitated classroom, you're starting to see more flex grouping happening, you're starting to see uh, 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 student choices happening, but I'm still in the majority of control in the classroom as the teacher, all right? Then the where we really begin gifted education is at the coached level. I'm gonna break down coached in just a second here, and the fourth level that is the most sophisticated level is what is called consultative. At the coached and consultative level is really where we see our gifted kids start to blossom. You'll note that I'm stepping away from control and students are starting to have to form more of the responsibility. So as the teacher's control decreases, student responsibility increases. So here are examples of the teacher's action versus the student action at the coach level. So I'm still looking at the standards, I'm still looking at the material that needs to be covered. However, what I'm looking for now is a greater degree of compacting, a greater degree of, of telescoping or identifying where kids have mastered, where there are errors, where there are lackings there. And then what I'm going to do is I'm gonna coach the student to set their own goal for the learning process. So they meet with, the student meets with the teacher then to define what is the specific goal that you want to achieve by the end of this course. And the student is working more independently on the achievement. They have to be managing their own goal attainment. They're meeting on a regular basis with the teacher and ultimately is responding to, through the feedback that's happening between the teacher and the student. When you're at these two levels, coached and consultative level, with little kids you may only get there once or twice a year, with older kids you will get there more often, um, and you have to decide where in the learning cycle I'm going to place this idea of a coached experience and a consultative experience. The most sophisticated, in, in the red book there's more information, more, more definition of what happens in a coached uh, lesson. Um, at the consultative lesson, this is the most sophisticated. And just as the term, uh, just as the title calls it, it's consult. I as the teacher am the consultant to the student. And as a consultant, I don't make the rules. I am there as advisory, I am there as support, I'm there as guidance, I'm there to assist the student. However, I don't do the work, the work is all being done by the student. So the student is setting the goal. The student is monitoring how, what materials, what resources they're going to need. The student is meeting with the teacher, and I'm sorry my graphics got moved when it it, it, I don't know, it did something there. My little graphics got there. But the student is going in for counseling with the teacher. Uh, the student is setting those things up. And critical here is that the student is setting up what's called a jury. And a jury is the evaluator of the product. So the student has to assemble a jury. Those of us that have done masters or uh, dissertations know that you form a jury of peers or of experts within the field, and that's, that's what's happening here. So again, you might wanna consider this in an elementary at maybe one time a year, in secondary a couple of times a year. We use this idea with our sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, so that in sixth and seventh, it's a coached idea, and by by the time they hit eighth grade, they're creating a, a capstone product that then is teachers totally consultative to that. And they can choose any of the teachers along the way to be their consult. It doesn't have to be their social study, eighth grade social studies teacher or eighth grade seminar teacher. It, it can be any teacher along the way that they felt a bond with where they would then use this as a consultative uh, factor. So this is, a component of accelerated pace, all right? Um, I wanna quickly go into defining, because there's only 10 minutes left and I got a whole workshop left here, uh, but I just wanna quickly go into defining depth and complexity for you, because again, those are two terms that, that teachers uh, don't really know what they're talking about when they say depth and complexity. So here it is, depth 
is the level of information that's necessary to solve complex problems within and across disciplines. That's what depth is. Kids are working in depth when they're using factual and procedural knowledge quickly and automatically. They're thinking abstractly through the concepts and they are incorporating much more, more advanced or independent levels of self-regulation. That's what depth is. Let me share with you, and I'm gonna just quick go here. Doo, doo, doo. I'm gonna skip all this stuff because um, I wanna, what I wanna share with you is this model of curriculum so that you can see where these pieces all fit into place. So, there it is, okay. This is, this is a model of curriculum here. At the base of your curriculum, you have what is called factual knowledge, okay? Factual knowledge is what we want our kids to know. Two times two is four, four times four is 16, the word 1812 is an 1812, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, A, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. That's all factual knowledge. How to spell things, all that stuff is, is fact, right? Factual knowledge is what we want our kids to know. We learn factual knowledge through repetition. This is why gifted kids are good at that because they need fewer repetitions to memorize facts than does the average student, all right? So that's what we want our kids to know is factual knowledge. Transcending up then is what is called procedural knowledge. Procedural knowledge is what we want our kids to do. However, within the framework of doing, there are two separate components to doing. There's a strategy and a strategy is a discrete conscious action. A discrete conscious action is a strategy. I can tell you that if I'm going to do an experiment, the strategy I'm gonna use is a scientific method. First, I'm gonna ask a question. Second, I'm going to do my background research. Third, I'm gonna create a hypothesis. Fourth, I'm gonna do my experiment. Fifth, I'm gonna come up with my data. And sixth, I'm gonna communicate it out to the public. That's a strategy, step by step. I can tell you exactly what step I'm on, all right? Transcending above strategy is what is called skill. Skill is when you, you, when you have amassed enough strategies that you can do it without thinking about it. You can do it without saying, okay, what step am I on? Now, here's something that we have to be careful with gifted kids, because I bet all of us have had this experience with a, with a bright child where we've said, well, how'd you get that answer? And the kid says, I don't know, I just knew it. Okay, that is because they transcended beyond or moved quickly beyond the strategy and usually the, 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 the question was not difficult enough where it was complex enough for them to have to fall back on a strategy to do it. And so they, we perceive them to be skilled, but that's not true. They probably lack certain strategies along the way. An example is driving. Driving is a skill, all right? But when we first learn to drive, we learn it very strategically. How much energy you're putting on the gas, when you put on your brake, when you turn your signals, how do you adjust the mirror, all that stuff is conscious, very conscious, I can tell you I'm doing it. However, when we're driving now, we're driving skilled. I can't, I don't know how much energy I'm putting on, I don't know when I move my foot, you know, it just happens, right? With gifted kids, what we have to be really be careful of is because they seem to be skilled, but they may lack those strategies in place. So my concern for you as teachers of gifted is always back your students down and say, let's consider what strategies you can use to solve this problem. Have them actually write them out. Strategy and skill includes thinking process. Procedural knowledge is also thinking, the thinking process. This is why, again, giving your kids many structures, those graphic organizers that they can use to solve problems. Graphic organizers are a great tool. We should always be using graphic organizers to help. I mean, we all use graphic organizers all the time. In fact, that's a graphic organizer to help me understand what is this thing that we're talking about here. Okay, procedure knowledge is what I want my kids to do. 
Now, in the gifted land, in the gifted land, I'm not going to do more facts. I might do different facts, but I'm not going to do more facts. In the gifted land, I'm not going to do uh, more of the procedures, but what I'm going to do is more sophisticated levels of those procedures. Again, you have in that packet a matrix on the, one of the back pages there, and that is a matrix for digging deeper into questioning. That's a part of the procedural aspect, so you can look at that and try to help kids dig deeper into different types of levels of questions. That would be in the procedural aspect. Finally, the, the final aspect of that is what is called conceptual knowledge. Conceptual knowledge is what we want our students to understand. We want them to understand concepts. We want them to understand generalizations. We want them to understand principles, and ultimately we want them to understand theory. Let me explain those, all those terms there. Theory is a definition that we give to very abstract ideas based on the research and based on the acknowledgement within the community that this is, okay? That's what a theory is. So like the theory of relativity, the theory of gravity, theory of force, okay? From that then, and from all of those experiments, then what we do is we narrow it down and say, okay, because this theory exists, then these rules have to be met to then make it part of that theory. So those rules are called the principles. Now we call them laws in some places, in science. Newton's laws are all a part of the theory of motion, okay, and force and energy. The theory of motion, force, and energy has Newton's three laws to it, okay? There are all kinds of laws, those are principles. Under that, then, what are called generalizations. Generalizations are the ways that we perceive the world. If I go to into, into a kindergarten class and say, okay, boys and girls, we're gonna talk about the concept of cycles. Cycles is a concept. I'm going to ask my, my kindergartners, what is your knowledge of cycles? And what do you think a kindergartner is going to say? A bicycle or a tricycle, because their knowledge, their generalizations of the concept of cycles is very concrete in a representation of a bicycle, all right? If I'm going to move that up, then what I'm gonna do is in my more advanced classes, what I'm gonna talk about are political cycles, theoretical cycles, philosophical cycles, cycles within music, okay? So we transcend the discipline that way, is through that part, which is the conceptual knowledge domain. That's what I want my kids to understand, are concepts and generalizations. Um, I was gonna do this, but we're, we've run out of time. Here are, uh, wait, wait, here are some generalizations based on the concept of power. Power can be real or perceived. Power is control. Power may have positive and or negative consequences. Power is assumed, and there is natural and human-made power structures. Those generalizations were crafted by uh, eighth graders. Okay, little kids can do this too. I've done this with little kids all the time. These are generalizations based on their experience with the concept of power. Then what we do is we craft from those essential questions. From their generalizations, then we craft essential questions. In what way is power real or perceived? In what ways does power control or why does power control? What are the positive and or negative consequences of power? How is power assumed? How do natural and human-made power structures compare and contrast? Those are the focus or the foci of the content that we're going to deliver in our GT classroom. So I, I, I've run out of time. Um, and I just gave you a scratching of the surface. Uh, if you're really interested, I would suggest you buy the book, Differentiated for Gifted Kids, read it, because all this stuff is in there in a much more deep uh, level. Um, and also, I'm, I'm more than happy to come back and do, as Rhonda knows, I love San Diego, um, especially living in Minnesota. Uh, but our weather is gonna be very similar to your weather here uh, this weekend, so. But I'm staying for the weekend, so. Uh, but I'm always happy to come back to, to San Diego. So if you have any questions, um, I have cards up here, so you're welcome to take a card with you, uh, or you've got my information on the handout as well. But thank you so much for taking time to be here with me, and hopefully you got one new idea you can walk away with. So thank you very much. Thanks.